is that we need to go and study the tabernacle of David. Don't think about tabernacle as in a tent, but as in a sphere, a domain of rule, a lineage, a dynasty, a family line. Because we can trace our roots back in the spirit to these uh, to people like David and the tribe of Judah. That we don't resurrect Christianity, number one, we do not resurrect Christianity in its various shades and forms. But we start to raise up the sons of God. Sustaining, refreshing expression of kingdom, you must first raise up the sons of God. If we want to create sockets through which the kingdom will thrive and be plugged into, the kingdom can only be plugged into sons of God. God's rule and reign comes through. We're talking about the right or the authority over dominions. And one of the greatest domains of God right now is not planet Earth or heaven. I mean, those things he created. The greatest domain is the people on the planet. And we have to start learning how to rule by starting our, with our own households. Our own spiritual houses. If, you meet, if your spiritual household meets in a residential unit, it must be a beautiful gathering, orderly, disciplined. It must represent rule over that space, that sphere. Are you hearing me? Um, if, if, if you have a building like this or you're meeting in some business a factory building. Learn how to rule over those environments by teaching your people that rule comes through us. There are disciplines and so forth. But government is upon us. It's our responsibility. That's the point. Responsibility. And that responsibility involves two things. If we want to see the increase of this government and peace. Shalom. If we're going to see how it proliferates how it advances. It's not going to advance. If you study the parables, the advancing of the kingdom is subject to secretive movements. You don't know what happens in the ground when you plant the seed. But you only know when it sprouts and bears fruit or bears crop. Similarly, we may not understand them, but we must believe that through us, things are happening. So the key words are order it, take time to erect it, erect the conditions, the environment. Um, I just, I think in Durban spoke about, and I will introduce the subject uh, when I do the Davidic line, about how to create in the systems to generate Hebronic communities, communities that are born in Hebron. Uh, Hebronic communities are high on relationships. Uh, you can't get to Jerusalem to rule with your 33 years if you've not ruled in Hebron for seven and a half. In other words, you have to go beyond the, in the number seven. You have to perfect relationships if you are going to rule in the city of Jerusalem. That's a critical demand that God has of each one of us. So when we talk about order, we have to erect systems. We have to erect environments. Now hear me very clearly. I've said this repeatedly. I want to say it again. God never put the man in the garden without first creating the environment and the atmosphere for that garden. It's called the six days of creation. God took six grace to create infrastructure, superstructure, support structures, environment, atmospheres, uh, invisible realms called the heavenlies, it will supply things that the earth can't supply to that man. Spiritual things come from heavenly dimensions. Earthly things come from within the planet. And so God did all of that. You have to, I realize you, we have to teach less and create better environments in which things can thrive. Don't ever say that, oh, it's about the word, so we'll just preach. But you can't clean your building, you can't set your chairs, you can't modulate the volume of your music. 
Because if you come to your church and your music is loud, you're singing at the, at the, at the pitch of screaming, and everyone is in a frenzy, and when it comes to teaching, they're not going to listen because their souls are so excited that their bodies are tired. <laughs> Everything. You go to a restaurant for the food and, the, and not the food. You go for the fellowship around the food. If you go to a good. And everything, the ambience supplies to the environment so that the food is made tastier by the people at the table. I ate in some really good places on this visit. They asked me how was the food, and I said it was brilliant. But I think what made it so good was our warm fellowship around the table. But what the things that irritated me was the loud music, and we had to ask them, cut it down. So that our, and the kingdom came as we were talking. There were downloads of revelation. What happened? Environment created the conditions for the download. Don't go to a restaurant to eat. You can do that anywhere. We're not animals. We don't live for food. Food lives for us. We go to a restaurant for fellowship. But it's around a meal. That's why the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. But you must have eating and drinking. That's what Paul is saying. But it is righteousness, peace, and joy. You leave the table feeling righteous, having greater peace, and going to bed with joy. That's the kingdom. So we have to order it. Say to your neighbor, order it. Create the environment. Establish it. Refresh it, energize it. So that's key. That's key. And this, I'm sure the Lord will give you the wisdom on how to create the conditions. But the loss of the kingdom to us, the human race, is presented to us in the story about Adam and Eve. And Adam didn't, you know, the word fall has to be qualified. Adam fell from his purpose. He was not created to do his own thing. He was created to represent the image and likeness of God. Adam was created so that in his, in his body, in his existence, in his being, the invisible God will be justified in the flesh. This is the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness is God invisible, justified in the flesh. Such an astonishment that even angels were amazed. Adam was not created for self-existence. Adam was created for the self-disclosure of the invisible God. So when Adam fell, he fell from the, from purpose, which was that in his relationship with God, God will be his father, he will be his God's son. He will be able to steward his father's creation so that all of creation will get to know the one who created them. That was the ultimate. He was not created to get rich, to pursue his personal agendas and ambitions, he was created to represent, to serve. And Adam failed. So he had custody over the whole of the planet, but he gave the keys of that custody, the executive privilege, the power of attorney. He signed it over to the devil. And in the temptation of Jesus, and the temptation of Jesus was a test permitted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit took Jesus into the wilderness so that the devil can test him. This was a divine setup for Jesus. And the test was, are you the son of God? That was the test. Have you qualified to rule? You see, a lot of us if you want to read Mark chapter 1, 
and Matthew chapter 4, we all talk about the baptism of Jesus, chapter 3 leading to verse chapter 4. The baptism of Jesus and how God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And many of us then rush to make the quotation that Jesus now says, after the father says, you are my son, Jesus now says, the kingdom of God, of heaven is near. Not true. Don't study what happens before Jesus says the kingdom as, is near or the kingdom has come. The first thing that happened after God said, this is my son, was Jesus surrendered himself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now was controlling Jesus, leading Jesus. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, to them gave he the power to be called the sons of God. Led there means to be sub subordinate or subjected to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes him and says, testing for you in a place where there's an absence of provision called the wilderness. And you stay there until you get tested by the devil. And what is the purpose of, what is the definitions of the word Satan or devil? Accuser of the brethren. And I know we can talk about accusation on a, on a very low level here. And we've all been victims of that. But think about accusation as in him coming to accredit whether you are really a member of the family. Think about attestation, validation. Prove to me you're a son of God. That's the test. So he comes to test you, not so that he can put a demon on you and put a curse on you and rob you of your rights to a better life in this world and, and so forth. No, don't, don't get caught up with that. Everything he does, whatever he flings at you, is just to see whether the son of God will come out of you. And, and when Jesus comes back from the test, which I, I'm going to quote one of the tests for you now, when he comes back from the test, he has to still wait until John the Baptist is beheaded or incarcerated before he can say the kingdom has come. In other words, he couldn't even announce the kingdom until the last voice was silenced. Because John the Baptist's view of the kingdom, and remember, John the Baptist said the same things in Luke 1. Whatever, one of the portions of the scripture. He said, the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus said the same thing, the kingdom of heaven is near. Same words. But his view of kingdom was totally different to the view of how God was going to reign in a son. Then Jesus said, the kingdom is near. And I want to say to us today, we have to, that's why I believe all the bits and pieces about sonship, reorganizing families, bringing back order. I mean, we've done hundreds and hundreds of hours of teaching. And so many different apostles have come and shared their perspectives and so many things. All of that now is colluding. It's confluencing. It's coming to a tipping point. All the bones of truth are now forming into one body. The flesh, the sinews. I mean, this is the army that is being formed. So we can't see every, anything anymore in piecemeal. We have to see the full thing. It is in that context, we have to understand that the devil is attesting sonship. Listen to my point now. The devil is attesting sonship because he knows that when sons of God appear back in the earth, or they migrate from being children to sons. Because as long as the hair is a child, he's under servants, custodians, guardians. He's in bondage, he's in slavery. But if he's a son, you can't keep him in bondage because his rule is on a throne. He has executive privilege. It's, an, it's what we call an axiomatic principle, an automatic principle. A devil knows that his lifespan on the earth is terminated when sons of God come. For this reason was the son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And don't just think about Jesus there because in him you are sons. So the devil knows that if he can keep you less than a son, he's keeping his reign revived and nourished. 
So subduing us is what his ultimate aim is. He is not interested in how many people get slain in your church. He is not interested in how many people get saved. He may be a little bit interested about that, but that's not his ultimate. He's not interested in your financial breakthrough or the Bentley you're driving. He's not interested on how many television programs you are on and which countries you travel to and how big your network is. Those things don't impress him. The moment he sees one son that carries the image of God, he knows this guy is going to destroy me. He knows this is a hair. And he doesn't want that. He wants, you can be disciples, you can be affiliates to a system called Christianity, a religion called Christianity. He's, he, he's not interested in if you go to heaven. As long as he can keep his heavenly position on the earth. Because outside of this position, he's in hell. Hear me, I may be saying some provocative things here. Because it shifts the evangelical, the missional perspective. His greatest argument is against sonship because a son called Adam had rights and privileges that he did not have. Angels, and if he is a fallen angel, that's my view, that's not Segi's. If he's a fallen angel, then he was created on the second day when, Adam, when heaven was created. Adam was created on the last day, the sixth day. So for many, and he's watched everything God created after heaven. He saw the, the planet Earth. He saw the sun, moon, and stars. He saw everything created. And he was the highest order in everything that God was doing. And then he discovered the greatest secret, which is that he was not created for these things. But this guy in the garden called Adam, but that woman walking naked, clothed in the image and likeness, the glory of God. This guy is going to rule over all things. He couldn't handle it and he protested. He says, this guy, you made him a little lower than you. I will not tolerate that because I was your son. God said, you're not my son, you're an angel. So he hates sons. He didn't kill Jesus for 30 years. He didn't even bother about Jesus for 30 years. But he bothered about him after the Bible tells us that a voice said, this is my son. You have to see sonship in a completely different way. So again, the devil, verse 8, Matthew chapter 4. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. All the, the word cosmos also means all the systems that manage creation, the created order of the earth, and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. The same thing Adam did. Adam gave him these things. Now, now Satan is saying to Jesus, the son, are you the son of God? Remember? All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. This is not singing. It's not coming to church and saying, I love you, Jesus, or I love you, devil. It's not worship. This is worth Expressed through work. When you come to lift your hands, you are saying everything I'm worth, measured by my work, I present to you. So you can never come with an empty hand before God. That means he never blessed you. He says, I'll give you what you want to restore the kingdom. But serve me. Represent me. I'll step aside. I'll go into Sabbath rest. 
but just work for me. Why? Because he understood the kingdom was given to Jesus. And so he says, serve me, worship me, work for me. And Jesus responds by saying, away with you, Satan, accuser of the brethren. For it is written, it is written, let me paraphrase, it is the eternal plan. That your worth is determined by the one who created you. You will worship the Lord your God and him, and him only you shall serve. That's the kingdom purpose. It is written that you were not created to be served. You were created to serve. You were created to serve human beings the sons of God, and they rule over you. That's what he was saying. I'll show you the scriptures because you, you won't want this to be backed up. I'll show you the scriptures. So, you don't try to project yourself and elevate yourself to what is not in the design. The design is very clear. We only, we are here to worship and serve God. So if you think, you know, I'm, I go to churches and I see these huge thrones, I see men elevating themselves, you have to kiss their signet ring, and only when they put their scepter on your head will you have access to them, and they're doing all these funny things, then I'm realizing these are demons. These are demonic people who use magical powers and foolish people are going to them for blessings. And these apostles that draw attention to themselves and celebrate themselves, I'm realizing we missed it completely. Let me share, share a parable with you, but I want to get to Hebrews chapter 1 at least before we close. Hebrews, uh, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 33 to 46. I want to show you a principle about a kingdom parable that speaks about how transfer of the kingdom takes place. It's called transfer by proper fruit bearing. Verse 33, here yeah, another parable. These are kingdom parables. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it dug a wine press in it and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and then went into a far country. Mark the words leased. Didn't give ownership. Let me give you an interpretation of Adam, God's son. God's son gave him a lease. Didn't give him the title of ownership. Why would you want your son to own something if you're going to live forever? Just let him enjoy the benefits. Am I correct? And Sabbath rest teaches us that. He just stepped aside, went into incarceration, remained invisible, and said, son, represent me. It's like a lease. So this is a picture of creation. Picture of creation. Creates something, hands it over, sets the terms of, of, of function, and then goes on a journey. We'll call the journey Sabbath rest. This is Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. Now when the vintage time grew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they may receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, stoned another, and this is the story of salvation history. And again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said amongst themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. That's what the devil did. 
That's what he did. And that's why he doesn't want us. He wants us to sell our birthright. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those fine dresses? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits of their seasons. I want you to see yourselves. If you're serving God, even though you're a son, you become a faithful, a good and faithful servant. This is the posture of do loss and sonship. You are God's son, but when you're in the earth, you function as God's slave. And slave here does not, don't, don't think about it from the historical views of slavery. Slave here means you don't live for yourself, you live for your master. You live for the one who sends you. Now look at what he says. And Jesus said to them, have you ever read in the scriptures, mark the words here, because this is what Daniel said, a stone, Daniel 2, will come from heaven and destroy the kingdoms, every kingdom on the earth will come. Listen to this. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. So we've rejected the sonship, we've rejected a lot of things, religion has, God now says, I'm going to make it the chief. And it was marvelous in our, in our eyes, verse 43. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will ta be taken from you. The right, the authority to rule, the government of God, the authority to have dominion, to, to, have, to, have, to exercise authority over dominions, will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing fruits of it. And we know that's what happened with Israel. They lost their right to rule. And we who were no people, God's brought us in. He's given us the right to rule. But the same principle, if it happens uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the mega level, the grand narrative is true to the, to, the, to the basic principle, the narrative, which is if you do not bear fruit, then God will take you out of it. If you can't do what he called you to do, then he has to remove you or not include you. Let me use a more better word. You will not be included. That's what is being said here. And listen to this. Now listen to this, bearing fruit. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. You know, I want you to go and study the stone. I've just got a whole lot of stuff on the stone here. The rock. The amazing thing is Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. You know, it's, that rock was the head that Jacob lay his head on. And later on, anointed with oil and said, this pillow will become the pillar. And we know that that pillar was rejected by the Jews God made it the cornerstone. And we are stones fitly joined to that stone to build a spiritual house. Daniel said, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. But he didn't tell the dream to his wise men, the people in his kingdom. He said, you tell me the dream and its interpretation or else I eliminate you. Daniel came and said, don't kill these wise men, you magicians. Let me go and seek God. It's found in Daniel chapter 2. And I'll come back and I'll tell you the dream. And God gave him the dream. And the dream was that a stone will come from heaven. And it'll split this huge image from head to toe. And you know that image is speaking of various echelons of government until it comes to the toes. I believe we're living in the toes of this dream. And that stone is called the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. What's the rock? It's a statement. Thou art Christ, comma, the son of the living God. What is that statement? This is the template. This is the blueprint. This is the genetic strain. This is the divine sperma. Christ 
in you the hope of glory. That if the seed, the sperma, the sperm called Christ is installed by the same spirit that dropped the same seed into the womb of Mary. Remember what Jesus said of the seed. He said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it, 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 it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears fruit. So Jesus was basically saying, I brought the divine sperm. In my death, I'm going to let it multiply. And the same spirit that dropped the sperm in, womb, in Mary is now going to drop that sperm in each one of you. And when that sperm grows up, it will be called the son of the living God. That's how we've been conformed to the image of Christ. We've been predestined. Romans 8, 29, predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. The firstborn, the image of the son, the firstborn in many brothers. And what does that mean when we talk about the stone? We're talking about a rock. And in Old Testament language, the rock was a, was a metaphorical description of God. Don't read it, all the scriptures on the rock. And this rock called Christ, the son of the living God. And you know 1 Corinthians 10 says, the rock that followed them in the wilderness is Christ. They all drank from that rock. When the Bible says that God is my rock and my refuge, it's speaking about Christ being your refuge. And this rock, which is the Son of God, is going to splinter every kingdom. And it's going to fill the earth with the image of God. And when the earth is filled with the image of God, every kingdom has to bow its knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. That's a critical, critical aspect of kingdom living. I'm ahead of myself. But the stone here is a very key principle, and you can go write sermons just on this rock. But we have a prophetic destiny, the prophetic destiny of the kingdom of God, or the rule and reign of God, or the right to rule, the right to rule is the restoration and reconstitution of all things. This is what God's going to do now. And it's only going to be done to people who are learning how to be fruitful. Fruitful doesn't, is not measured by how many souls you saved and how your gifts operate. That's a pneumatic view of the Bible. Your, your position in the earth is not to be measured by your little gift. We sold gifts like we sold penance in the church. We have to come back to a place of understanding that we have been raised to bring everything back to its original intent. Not back to the garden, back to how God designed for us to function. Are you hearing me? And to do that, there's a portion of scripture I want to leave with you. It's found in Acts 3.17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your your rulers, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus was fulfilled. Now this is in Acts, okay? Jesus had already died and rose again. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. In other words, change the way you think and move so that God can release refreshment back you and that he may send Jesus Christ now this is after Jesus came this is what I would call the second coming the final resurrection and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive listen to this the word receive here means detain accommodate hold into Give temporary accommodation to. That's the best way. Think about a hotel. You go and book in for a period of time. And uh, after that period of time, you have to now leave the hotel. Heaven cannot let Jesus go until his stay is fulfilled. Jesus can't come back unless certain things happen. 
According to Hebrews chapter 4, he has already entered into his rest, so he can only passively wait until all his enemies be made his footstool. That's what, that's what Hebrews 10 tells us. So there is a fundamental prerequisite from us, and listen to this, heaven must, must receive. Remember, a cloud received him. That's a cloud of witnesses in Acts chapter 1. A cloud received him. That was not a cloudy day. And he passed through the clouds. The same cloud that followed them in the wilderness, the same cloud that was on the Mount of Transfiguration, is the same cloud now that received him and said, sit on top of all of us. Until you can come in those clouds to receive the church. So that cloud is keeping him, detaining him, restraining him until something happens. Look at what happens. Whom heaven must receive until. Everyone say until. This is what I call the causative principle. Cause and action. If certain conditions are not right, certain things can't happen. Until. Until what happens? The restoration or reconstitution of all things. Until everything is brought back to its original intent, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And you can go on and read. So there is a fundamental prerequisite. And it's going to only come with an upgraded way we think. Some of you are already probably needing to be provoked in these areas. And I say that sincerely. Because most of us got this idea is we'll just be, live our good lives. We'll do our little bit in the church. We'll serve where we can. We'll give as generously as we can. And then we'll die, fly away, get into the cloud, and enjoy paradise. That is life. It's the most vain way of living, and it insults the intelligence of God. We can't think like that anymore. We have to thank God. There's been breaches, there's been ruins, there's been broken down walls, your city lies desolate. How can we become a generation that says we're part of a re restoration order, a reconstitution of things? How do we bring back the eternal plans into our lives so that we can become the people that you have ordained us to be? Are you with me? So this is key. I want to jump a bit. I, I, I would suggest that you go and look at all the prophecies that need to come to pass. I want to read this prophecy to you because I think we're living in it now. Daniel 2, 44 to 45. I, I quoted this, but I want to read it now. And in, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. We all know that that kingdom only came with Jesus. It was, the reign of God was always in the earth, but not the way it came with Jesus. Because it came with him as a son, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. Everyone say other people. And we are not other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. I thought about this. I thought about this. Since Jesus said, I will build my church, the gates of hell will not uh, And I give you the keys to the kingdom. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Because think about it here. I'll build my church. It will become the standard by which nothing can prevail against it. And I will give this church every authority, both in heaven and on earth, and they will exercise extraordinary abilities. I thought about it. Do you know something? The church is the only thing since Jesus founded it that continues to thrive. Every other kingdom has been falling, and some have been coming up, but falling. We're already, even in our most desolate positions, we're part of an eternal kingdom that cannot be suffocated. 
And eventually this church has to become like a mountain. The stone must become a mountain. It will fill the entire earth and there will be no other hiding place but for everyone to come and say, we want you to be our refuge. But look at what it says here. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Say to your neighbor, the dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. You know, one of the mysteries of Daniel is that God told him to seal certain things in the book, codify it, and drop it into the river Euphrates until the time and the time and the and the times. And I really believe we're living now in the days of the desolation of Daniel. Kingdoms are falling. I mean, think about powerful kingdoms like Syria. In ruins. Think about how Europe is changing by the day. We're witnessing how ancient thrones are falling. So many things are happening. And I know it's got to do with the stone becoming bigger and bigger. And this stone is called Christ, the Son of the living God. Those were the statements of, of Peter. Jesus said, upon this rock, Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. Revelation eleven fifteen to 18. I really want to read Hebrews 1 for you, but let's just quickly read this. Then the seventh angel sounded. Everyone say seventh angel. That's the seventh move, seventh messenger, seventh communication from God. I'd like to think we're living in that moment. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become. The kingdom of our Lord and of His. Are you His Christ? Are you the body of Christ? And He shall reign and the 24 elders who sat before the th God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the, destroy the earth. I think we're living in this day. Can I close? I'm going to jump ahead of my time, but I want to close with Hebrews. We're going to do something that I want to speak into the record of this. I want to speak. The book of Hebrews has always been one of the most difficult books to read. Everything I told you will be summarized in what I'm going to read now. So we're going to read from verse 1. I'm going to read chapter 1 and chapter 2. I believe that these, some of these statements I could not make sense of it, but I want you to make sense of it in the light of many things I told you, and I've left many things hanging in the air because of time. But I want you to listen to me. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers in the prophets. Not by, in, correct Greek. But in these last days spoken to us in son, not in his son. The word is is in italics. It's not in the original text. In these last days, when did the last days start? After Jesus was resurrected. At least on the day of Pentecost. But in these last days speaks in son. So whatever God wants to do, whatever administration is in a corporate son. And it refers to the patent son also, Jesus and his body. There's only one son in Christ, whom he has appointed heir of. Has the son been appointed heir of all things? Now let me ask you a question, because you can argue with my reading. Are we heirs of Christ? Yes. 
heirs of the Father. Yes. Are we joint heirs with the Son? Yes. So whatever the Son has, do you get? Yes. Correct. Now, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, that Son, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. In other words, he is now in an executive position of rule. <clears throat> Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance inherited a more excellent name than they. The question is, what is the name? Is it Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Prince of Peace? No. Look at what it says. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my? So that's why when people say that in the days of Noah, the sons of God were cohabiting and having sexual relationships with the sons of the daughters of men, those are not angels. That's the pure line of set. Having sexual relationships with the line of Cain, the murderer, and producing, yes, powerful people. But this is not angels having sex because they can't procreate. You know that heaven tells us that. In heaven, angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can't reproduce after their kind. That's the only order of creation that does not have seed bearing capacity. Otherwise, they or devils will be increasing their numbers all the time. <laughs> and think about it. Think about it. Now look at this. To which of the angels he ever said, You are my son. Today I've begotten you. And again, I will be to him a... Eh? And he shall be to me a... Eh? And remember, Jesus comes to show us the way. He was God, pre-existent. He's showing us God's name is not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's name is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit only because that's the way he wants to introduce himself to us. His name before the creation of heaven on earth is indescribable, ineffable. He doesn't need a name. He is God. But he wants it to be understood how he comes to us. Now look at this. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship or serve him. That's what Jesus told the devil also. And, the angel, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, for as many as received him to them gave you the power to be called? Son. Are you a son? Yes. Did he ever call you Christian? No. no, Antioch. People in Syria called us Christians. Nice name, keep it, but that's not what God called us. But to the son he says, your throne. Oh God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You rule with righteousness, justice. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your fellows, your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are your the other works of your hands they will perish but you will remain they will grow old like a garment like a cloak you will fold them up and they will be changed but you are the same and your your years will not fail but to which of the angels has he ever said Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister 
for those who will inherit salvation? Next verse, chapter 2. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Why must we if it's not about Jesus? We don't need to know anything if, if this is only about Jesus. This is about Jesus and us. So don't drift away from what God has called us to be. Now look at this. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we, if we neglect so great a salvation? So what is salvation here? Not about leaving hell to go to heaven. Salvation here is about your inheritance, which is sonship and the right to rule. This is salvation. Now look at this. Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Now verse 5. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Let me paraphrase, that your mind is full of him. What is man that you think so much about him? Or the son of man that you care for him. The word care means to give such considerable attention to. Why are you so jealously possessive and protective over this man? You have made him a little lower than the Elohim, a little lower than yourself, which includes maybe lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have set him over the works of your... What did God create? Did he create the heavens? Did he create the earth? Did he create everything? Yes. I remember the story. I told some of you the story. Let me say it again. You know, in this church, in recent years, well, since its inception, people that were barren, couldn't have children, would come into this environment and just have children. So I tell people, don't join this church if you don't want to fall pregnant. <laughs> they, and one couple that joined us was married for about seven or eight years and couldn't fall pregnant, just couldn't have children. And when they stepped into this church, they fell pregnant. And they were so excited, and because they were really with us from the very beginning when we first started at the Balalaika, I, there was such an attachment to these people that stood with us when we had nothing. And I'll never forget the day when the baby was born and they insisted, they begged Merol and I, if we would come and just bless the child in their home. But they wanted to show us their baby in their home. And I went into the house, and the whole house was like redecorated to accommodate the baby. This was a girl, so everything was pink. <coughs> I mean, the furniture was child friendly. The whole house, I looked at this and I'm just saying, these people took nine months to reorganize everything as if their whole world is centered around this girl. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, that's exactly what we did. We took seven, six days to create everything in heaven and earth before we put the hay in the garden. That's what he said. And he said, like responsible parents, we don't put our children and then hope they'll fend for themselves. We first provide everything they need, then we put them into the garden. When I thought about that, I said, God, do you mean you created everything in heaven for me? Yes. Everything on the earth, yes. Everything around me, yes. Even the angels, yes. In fact, everything was created to serve you, and you was created to serve me. It's called ecosystem, a whole ecosystem. The whole food chain was only for us. Everything. What is man that your mind is so full of him, that you set him over the works of your hands? You've put all things in subjection, all things in subjection under his feet. Didn't say, yeah, air and the birds of the air, the ocean and the fish in the ocean, and the land and all its, its, its creations. 
No, it says all things. All things for me means all things. Not a jewel in my crown. Not a crown if I behaved well on the earth. Not a little throne if I worked hard. Not a little house that I call my mansion. Everything. So how can we sell heaven cheaply? When he's given us everything. We are bigger than heaven. We are bigger than the earth. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Everything was created for you. Not for you to go to heaven or choose earth at the expense of heaven. Everything was created for you. And everything will serve you. Yes, maybe we're not there yet because this is what it says. For in that he put all things in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not, under, not put under his feet. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Look at the next verse. For it was fitting for him uh, for him, for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing what? Jesus. To glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So God perfected it through him so that we could come into this dimension. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of? So are we one with Christ? Yes. Is he one with us? Yes. yes. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them? Brethren, Brethren means from the same womb, from the same side. We share the same origin. We share the same father. Saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. I'll teach them your nature, your character, your abilities. In the midst of the assembly, that's congregations, churches. I will sing praises to you. I'll just teach them your way. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. And as, as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. That's our roots. The seed of Abraham is not the natural Jew. The seed of Abraham is the seed of Christ. That's those who believe in Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had... He had to be made like his brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. So make propitiation for the sins of, the, of people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, is able to aid those who are tempted. And then it goes to chapter 3. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession or profession, Christ Jesus. Study him to know who you are. Your job description is in him. And you can go on and read. We have to take back what is rightfully ours. We have to. There's so much more. But I know that God will fill in all the gaps. I want you to stand. The kingdom of God is near. But right now it needs to become nearer. The kingdom is coming. But it must have come closer to, your, to the realization of who you are. Your right and authority to rule over the domains that God has given you is a vested privilege that comes with sonship. So I want you to appreciate who you are in Christ. This is not, I'm not talking about us as just 
from a postmodern New Age perspective. We're not gods in the carnal. We're the sons of God. In other words, we proceed out of him. We're not born from the earth. We are born from above. Just appreciate who you are in Christ. Appreciate your place in the earth. As leaders, most of you, you have an awesome responsibility to bring this mind into every soul that you are shepherding, raising up on behalf of him. Bring our churches to grow up into an understanding of what God wants for us. Come, just, just appreciate the Lord. Allow this thing to fill your spirits and possess your minds and take you captive to Christ. Don't leave this place until you become a prisoner of Christ. A doulos of God. Karamanda Rabasikata I want to ask you a very simple question. We'll pray together shortly. Do you give permission to the God and Father of our faith, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father of our Lord? Do you give him permission to rule over your piece of earth, spirit, soul, and body? The invisible and the visible, the natural and the spiritual, the seen and the unseen, do you? Do you give him permission to take hold of that serpent in your mind that beguiles and suffocates thinking? As leaders, can you see yourself as a vehicle through which the Lord rides into a city, into a region? Has he the absolute and total and sovereign reign of your life? For the Lord to remove the devil, he can do it momentarily. But to remove the serpent from you, he demands your permission. He cannot do it without you. That's the volitional principle, the moral principle. I want you to make a fresh surrender today. God, I'm not playing games. I'm not here for myself. I refuse to be a part of the serpentile generation that wants to do things for glory and for kingdom for myself. Can you make a dedication? I'm here for you, Lord. I'm going to serve you as if my whole life is vested on them. There's no existence I have outside of you. That must become your prayer today. Justin said something very powerful about the mind today. Many of us have religious minds, suspicious minds, speculative minds, traditional minds. We have mystical minds. We have, our minds have been possessed by demonic forces. Right now, I want you to give your mind back to God. That he can sit on it and rule over you. He can rule over your thoughts. He can rule over your lives. And believe me, we're going to see a proliferation of the kingdom in this season. We're going to see God rule and reign in a way that you've not seen. But I know God told me this. He said you will be, there will be visible manifestations of that which was once unseen. Father, we lift our hands to you. And bring our hearts before you. We are here not in a religious way to dedicate ourselves to you, but everything we have, we want you to have it. 
We want you to possess our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our souls, our mortal bodies. We want you to possess everything we have. We want you now, Lord, to be the supreme and magisterial ruler of all things. If you cannot reign through us, you will not reign the world. And if the gospel of the kingdom must go to all nations, it must first come into us. So Lord, bring down walls, bring down false positions, inaccurate mentalities, bring down attitudes that are wrong. Bring it down, Father. Bring us to a place where we realize that if you cannot rule over us, you're not going to rule over the space we occupy. So Lord, I'm praying right now for a fresh mentality. For the mind of Christ to be reinstalled in every one of us. For a transformation to take place in us that we've not seen before. That when we go back into our dreary and defeated environments, there will be a little breaking of light in dark places. There will be a removal of false positions and demonic activities. The demons that once occupied our space will now automatically be evicted without we even casting them out. Oh, Father, raise up your kingdom in us. The right to rule so that we will have authority over the regions that you've placed over us. Father, I bless your people with wisdom, counsel, and knowledge as they understand the things the Spirit is saying in this. We want to declare that the dream and interpretation of Daniel would become a sure realization in our time. That stone is going to destroy until it is ground into fine powder every kingdom, every illegal rule that has come against us. We cancel its works and we declare that your kingdom is going to prosper and it's not going to fall upon ground that cannot yield fruitfulness. Lord, unlike other generations and other nations, we refuse to accept that you will take the kingdom from us and give it to another people. We are not another people. We are your sons and daughters. We are growing up into Christ and we will step into our reality, into our fulfilled destiny. So I bless everyone here, Father. I bless everybody. I know something is going to happen. There's going to be an explosion, an eruption, a movement like we've not experienced before. It's going to happen in this place. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For yours is the kingdom, the dominion, and the power. To you be all the glory. Blessed be your name, Father. We bless you. We bless you. Amen. Amen. Well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.